Good morning. morning. Open your Bibles again, or if you're like me, just turn it on and find Ephesians chapter 3, where in just a moment I will be preaching based on that passage of Scripture that's been read this morning. Before I begin preaching, though, Pastor, if you could step here just for one moment. I have a small gift of appreciation from Golden Gate Seminary and from me personally for inviting me to preach in your church today. So thank thank you you so much, and we hope you enjoy that. Thank Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I have also met two graduates of Golden Gate while I've been on your campus today. I was quite surprised by that and then delighted. If any of the rest of you would like to be graduates of Golden Gate, see me. We can arrange for you to get started as soon as possible. (laughs) Your church is in the midst of its mission's emphasis. And this morning, I've been asked to preach about your responsibility for the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've already heard this morning a scripture reading from a man named Paul who wrote describing his responsibility for the gospel, for sharing the gospel, for communicating the gospel to other people, which is the essence of our mission responsibility. Let's look again at the text and learn these principles this morning. First, we see in this text this first truth, and that is your responsibility for missions was received at the moment of your conversion. Now look what Paul wrote about himself. He said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me. Now there are two phrases in this passage or in this verse which require explanation. First, Paul wrote, I became a servant of the gospel. Now the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is not normally something we think of as requiring our service. Normally, normally when we think of serving, we think of serving someone, doing something for someone they cannot do for, them, uh, do for themselves, or doing something for someone that will make them more successful, or doing something for someone that will expand their sphere of influence. I have an assistant who serves me, and she makes all of those things happen for me as she works alongside me in ministry. When we think of serving someone, we understand what that concept means. But Paul says in this verse, I became a servant of the gospel, meaning that he did for the gospel what it could not do for itself. He he made the gospel more successful. He expanded the gospel's sphere of influence. Listen, the gospel has power within itself. The gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, has the power to transform life. So why does the gospel need to be served? And if it is served, how is it served? Well, frankly, the gospel, there's only one thing the gospel can't do for itself, and that is share itself. It has to be shared by someone, transported by someone, given out by someone. And so when Paul said, I became a servant of the gospel, he said, I took on the mission responsibility of sharing the gospel with other people. And when? Well, and that's, that's in the next phrase of Scripture. He said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me. Now, this is a phrase of Scripture which refers to Paul's salvation experience or his conversion experience. We might read in the previous chapter, for example, in the book of Ephesians, Paul writing these words. He said, for by grace you are saved. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so echoing what he's already written, he writes these words, I became a servant of the gospel when? In the moment of receiving the gift of God's grace in my life. Or, in our words, in the moment of my conversion. So Paul writes of himself this way, I became a servant of the gospel, a person on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the moment of my conversion or my commitment to following Jesus. Now here's some interesting news for you this morning. The same truth is true of you. You have been given the responsibility of serving the gospel. You have been given the responsibility of sharing the gospel, making the gospel more successful, and enlarging the gospel's sphere of influence. We call that missions. And when did you receive that responsibility? In the moment of your conversion. Now, you may not have realized that was happening in the moment of your conversion. 
For example, you may have been a child in Sunday school hearing a teacher explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, you receive Jesus by praying and simply asking him to be your Lord and Savior. You may not have realized in that moment you were getting this significant responsibility. Or perhaps it was later in life for you. You were a college student and someone shared with you the gospel and you then there perhaps in your dorm room accepted Jesus Christ's free gift of salvation. In that moment, you received this responsibility to be on mission with the gospel. Perhaps you were older, an adult who heard the gospel through friends or family members or work associates and considered it for many months, perhaps years. But in the moment that you finally came to place faith in Jesus Christ, even at that later stage of life, in that moment, you, you became responsible for being on mission with the gospel. Now you're looking at me like you still don't believe me. And here's why you're struggling. Because you're thinking, is it really possible that I could receive that much responsibility from a simple commitment and not know that I was receiving all of this responsibility? And the answer to that is yes. In fact, we do it in life all the time. We make commitments without fully realizing all the responsibilities that come in the moment of that commitment. Let me give you two simple illustrations. In the United States, at our seminary, we have something called syllabus shock. That's when a professor hands you the syllabus for your class and you see all of the reading and all of the writing and all of the responsibility and you are shocked at how much work is required. And you say, do I really have to fulfill all this responsibility? Yes, you do. Because when you applied for and were admitted to our school and you were assigned to a degree program, in that moment of commitment, you took on all this responsibility. Here's another example of how we do this. Marriage. <laughs> we stand in a moment of time and say, I do. But really, we have no idea what we are doing. <laughs> We are in that moment making a commitment, but taking on a massive amount of responsibility. Now, I, for example, have been married for 33 years to my wife, Ann, who's traveling with me this week. But I have been married to three different women. When I married Ann, she was a quiet, shy, simple young bride. And then she changed into super mom with three children. And now that our children are older, she's morphed again into ministry dynamo and re speaking and writing and mentoring. And I marvel at the change that's come about in her and how much change that's brought into my life over the years. Recently, I was talking this over with my wife and I said, I've been married only once for 33 years. But I've been married to three different women. And she smiled and said, I know. <laughs> I said, I was married to quiet, shy Ann, and then I married super mom Ann, and now I'm married to ministry dynamo Ann. How many more of you are there, I wanted to know. <laughs> As my wife has changed over the years, my responsibility to fulfill my commitment in my marriage has been to learn to love her, support her, and help her become all the person God wants her to be, right? But I did not know all of that in the moment of my commitment to be married. What I'm saying is this. It's possible for you to make a commitment and to receive many responsibilities in that moment that you do not fully understand, and this is one of them. In the moment of your initial commitment of your life to Jesus Christ, you became a servant of the gospel, responsible to share it, make it more successful, expand its sphere of influence. You became responsible to be on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why this message this morning is for everyone. It's not for a special, unique person called a missionary who's going to go somewhere else around the world with the gospel. It's for every one of us in this room who's a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, the second principle I want you to see in the text is this. Your responsibility to serve the gospel or to be on mission with the gospel is primarily to people, not places. Now notice what the text says. Paul says, I'm responsible to get the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul described his missionary responsibility in terms of getting it to people, to non-Jews who, who, who were scattered around the Mediterranean world. 
Now, why is it significant that he used the phrase Gentiles rather than some place name? You know, in the New Testament, Paul was one of the best traveled Christians of his era. The book of Acts, for example, in the Bible records several journeys that he took around the Mediterranean world to the major cities of his day. Travel in that time was difficult, much more so than our day. My wife and I marveled last evening that we were able to fly across the Pacific Ocean in 15 hours, marveling at the gift and miracle of modern-day travel, but not so in the first century world. For in that world, travel was difficult and challenging, and very few people ever left the close environment, environs of their village or their city. Paul, however, was a well-traveled Christian, and so if anyone were going to refer to being on mission with the gospel as a geographic assignment, it certainly would have been Paul. But no. Instead, he said, God has sent me on assignment to the Gentiles, to people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. So therefore, this morning, your responsibility to be on mission is not so much to go someplace far distant, learn a new language, and immerse yourself in a strange culture. No, your responsibility on mission is to send the gospel out from where you are to as many people as possible around you, and then to, yes, support those who go far away with the gospel, and perhaps to become one of those. But even if you don't, you still have a responsibility to get the gospel to as many people as possible. Now, I find a, a, one way of doing this is challenging our students at Golden Gate to think about their responsibility for being on mission. When someone comes on our campus as a new student, I often ask them, what do you plan to do when you graduate? And because our school is large and we attract students from all over the world, in fact, only 40% of our students are Anglo-Americans. The rest come from the nations of the world. And so because they come from all over the world and they plan to go all over the world, I'll ask them, what do you plan to do when you graduate? And they often answer me with a missionary answer. They say, Mr. President, I plan to go to Brazil when I graduate or to China when I graduate or I plan to go to Russia when I graduate. I'm always delighted to hear those answers, but then I ask a trick question in response. I say, well, then which Brazilian church or which Chinese church or which Russian church do you plan to join while you're here in the Bay Area? For you see, in the San Francisco Bay Area where we live, there are over 160 languages spoken in the public schools by children who attend, in the, by children who come out of our community. There are churches of every nation on the earth, almost every people group represented in the San Francisco Bay Area. And when a student says to me, oh, I don't plan to join one of those churches, that's for after I graduate. I will sometimes gently confront them and say, oh, so you're really not called to reach Brazilians or Chinese or Russians with the gospel. You just want to go on a trip. <laughs> Do you see the difference? If you are called on mission to a people and you are passionate about getting them the gospel, you will start with the Russians who live across the street, the Chinese who live across the street, the Brazilians who live across the street, and you will reach them with the gospel before you will go around the world to do the same. Does that make sense to you this morning? So Paul says to you, and I say to you, you have become responsible to be on mission with the gospel in the moment of your conversion, and that responsibility is primarily to get the gospel to as many people as possible, not necessarily to go a far distance in your travels. Then third, this passage says when you accept your own mission responsibility, you place yourself in the midst of God's eternal purposes for the universe. Now that's quite a bold statement. No notice where it says it in the scripture. Starting with me reading in the middle of verse 8. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through him, we, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is some of the richest theological language in the New Testament. Paul writes these words. This, is the, this, this idea of the gospel being spread to all people is the administration of the mystery of God. The working out of the secret things of God. What does that mean? Well, in summary form, it means this. First, there was God. 
and nothing else. And then God spoke and a universe came into existence. And then God spoke again and a man was created and alongside him a woman. God was in the process of creating a people for himself to share fellowship for all time in heaven with him. But sin entered the world and people fell away from God. So he sent a redeemer, Jesus Christ. And now God is in the process of bringing back to himself a people for his own for all time. To be his companion people forever in heaven. That's a lot in a few sentences, but that is God's grand uh, plan for the universe. He created a universe. He created people. He redeemed people back to himself, and he's planning to have a people for his own, for his companionship and fellowship for all time. That's the administration or the outworking of the mystery, the wonderful secret thing of God. Well, Paul says when you enter into sharing the gospel with people, you enter into, as, the, as it says at the end of verse 11, the eternal purposes of God through Jesus Christ. This means, and I know this is a breathtaking statement, this means that it's possible for you to enter into and to be a part of something that lasts forever. You're thinking, not me, not me. I'm sure that sounds good, and it's probably for someone in this room, but it's not for me. You would like to say back to me, uh, preacher, you don't know how ordinary my life really is. Yes, I do. Because my life is also very ordinary. What do I mean? Well, let's describe what tomorrow will be like for you. You will get up, take a shower, eat some breakfast, go to work. Our school, work, 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 study, 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 lunch. <laughs> then after lunch, work, 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 study, study, study. And then you go home and you cook the meal or you wash the dishes or you bathe the children or you wash the clothes, you watch a little TV, maybe a movie, go to sleep. Tuesday. You get up, you take a shower, you eat a little breakfast, you go to work. Our school, work, 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 study, study, study. Lunch! <laughs> Am I describing your life? Because that's my life. So much of our lives are so routine, so temporary. Wouldn't you, like, wouldn't you like just for a moment to know that you were able to be a part of something eternal? Some weeks ago, or some months ago, a man said to me, I have some questions about the Bible. Could we talk about them? So we sat down for that conversation and he asked me a series of questions about the Bible, about Jesus Christ, and about Christianity. I answered those questions and after about 45 minutes or so, he said, I think I understand this. What do I do now? I said, well, it's really simple if you're ready. You confess your sin to Jesus Christ. You ask him to forgive you and come into your life as your Lord and Savior. And you commit to living for him for the rest of your life. He said, I'm ready. Let's do that right now. We bowed our heads. He prayed. And I've watched him over these past few months as his life has been transformed as he's following Jesus and learning what that means. But in the moment when he prayed with me and committed his life to Jesus Christ, in that moment I was a part of something eternal. Something that will last forever. Something that gave my life meaning beyond all of the daily routine that I sometimes live through. Something happened through me that will last forever. Forever, I shared the gospel. Someone believed in Christ. We're going to heaven together and we'll be with God forever. Recently, I heard a person stand to speak and he said this. He said, I thank God that you sent missionaries to my country. And one of those missionaries came to my village. And the first time ever in my village, the gospel was preached. And I believed the gospel as a child. And I was given ed educational opportunities by my village leaders and later by my country leaders. And I came to America to study. 
And that led me to consider the gospel ministry as a responsibility, and I've committed my life to serving in the ministry of the gospel and have done so for many years. And then he said this, but I never forget that it was because of people like you who wrote checks and made offerings and offered prayers and called out a missionary and sent that man who came to my village that I came to know Jesus Christ. And he said, every one of you who participated in that, every one of you is a part of my eternal salvation in Christ. Listen, you can be a part of the eternal work of God by getting on mission with the gospel, by sharing the gospel, by giving so others can share the gospel, by praying for people who are sharing the gospel, by doing these things, you are a part of something eternal. And I want my life to have that kind of impact. Don't you want yours to as well? I want my life to rise beyond the mundane, the, the routine, the everyday that so much of us have to live with. And I'm not critical of all of that because just like you, I have to take care of my daily responsibilities. But from time to time, I want to know that my life mattered for something beyond the daily grind of just living. And in Jesus Christ and his gospel and sharing it around our neighborhoods and around the world, we can find that kind of eternal impact. And then last, if you do all of these things, the last principle in this text is that if you are serious about sharing the gospel and being on mission with the gospel, it will require some sacrifice. Notice just the last verse, the last verse which says, Paul writing, Don't be discouraged for my afflictions on your behalf, for they were for your glory. Apparently, the recipients of this writing from Paul had heard about how hard he had worked on their behalf and how much he had sacrificed to get them the gospel. And they were discouraged for him and concerned. But he said, don't let that bother you. Actually, it's for your glory. And I'm glad to do it. Now, some misguided preachers will tell you that if you follow Jesus and join him on his mission of sharing the gospel in our world, that it will make you healthy and it will make you wealthy. You'll be blessed beyond measure and all your problems will go away. Well, those are lies. I'm here to tell you the truth. The truth is if you are on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will cost you. It will cost you your time and your energy and your money to get the gospel to other people. It means you'll have to set aside some of what you want to do in order to get the gospel to other people. It means you'll have to sacrifice something of who you are to make that happen. Now, frankly... I'm sometimes discouraged by how little the church is willing to sacrifice to get the gospel to other people. Not sacrifice, we don't even want to be inconvenienced to get the gospel to someone else. But when I look at our world and I see how many people are willing to sacrifice so much for other religious movements and other political movements and even other intellectual movements, I'm awed and humbled by their sacrifice and frustrated that as Christians we're not willing to sacrifice even more. Here's one story to illustrate what I mean. A few years ago I came across a book called The Cry of the Kalahari by Mark and Delia Owens. It's a fascinating story of their lives spent in a desert region of Africa. I'll paraphrase the early part of their story. They, were, they met in a university classroom and very soon discovered they both had a passion for Africa. So they determined at one point to simply sell everything they had and go to Africa and start their work, believing that once they arrived, somehow the resources would be provided to sustain them. So in their book, they describe the story of selling their household belongings and all of their personal items. Finally, they were down to just owning an old car. They took it down to a place where Mark worked, and when the men were coming off the night shift, they auctioned the car off to the highest bidder. They conclude that part of their book by saying this, we had two pup tents, two, camping, two sets of camping equipment, $6,000 and one-way tickets to Johannesburg. It was all we had. We had sacrificed everything, but we were going to Africa to study the brown hyena. These were not missionaries. These were people who met in a science classroom at their university and realized they both had a passion for advancing scientific knowledge of the wild hyena, the brown hyena in Africa. And they were willing to sacrifice everything about their lives to go there and do this thing. Now, I'm not critical of them. In fact, I frankly admire them. 
There's not anything wrong with advancing scientific knowledge. That's a good thing. I don't denigrate their sacrifice. I just ask us as Christians this question. What will we sacrifice for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Something far more valuable with eternal consequence that means so much more than learning about a large carnivore in an African desert. What will we sacrifice for the gospel of Jesus Christ? So I challenge you this morning to take this passage of Scripture seriously. It says these simple truths. In the moment of your conversion, you became responsible to be on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And your mission is primarily to people, not places. And when you start sharing the gospel of Christ or making it possible for it to be shared by others, you enter into God's eternal purpose for the universe. And if you're serious about this, it will cost you some time, some energy, some money. But like Paul said, you will not begrudge the sacrifice because you will recognize it is for God's glory in the lives of the people who will hear the gospel because of you. Thank you for letting me share this message this morning about being on mission with the gospel. Now let me pray for you as God seals it in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of preaching here today and for challenging this dear church to be on mission for you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will convict them deeply of this message, burn it in their hearts, and give them a commitment to apply it as they go forward from today. And use this church in ways it's never imagined to get the gospel, not only around their communities here in Hong Kong, but all around the world. And thank you for hearing our prayer about this today in Jesus' name. Amen.